All right, so why don't you grab your copy of God's Word and meet me in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. As you're turning there, let me remind all the men that are typically slow to sign up for anything. We are having a men's conference in less than uh, two weeks. We're about 12 or 13 days away, and we're going to have a great time in worship. We have people coming from all over the United States, some people flying from Brazil, and they're gathering here at our campus to lift up the name of Jesus. So I want to encourage you to sign up in the foyer or online sometime this week. We're going to have a great time together. If you're a female and your husband's like, he never signs up for anything, sign up for him, okay? They're a little slow if you haven't figured it out. And uh, sometimes you got to pay for them and sign them up, and then it's going to be a great time together, all right? Calling all men at New Life. All right. Don't just give me an amen. Make sure you sign up. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, we're going to kick off today a brand new... Now, I haven't, I haven't decided if it's going to be six weeks yet or seven weeks. It might even go eight weeks. We're going to look at the life of David. And the title of the series is David from Shepherd to King. Let's all say it together. Ready to go. David Excellent. And uh, today, the title of the message is, uh, we're going to look at the life of David, a nobody, nobody noticed. A nobody, no, nobody noticed. And maybe you came to church today and, and you feel like that. Maybe you feel like that at your job or you feel like that at school. You feel that, like that at your work. You feel like that in your neighborhood. You feel like that at our church. That I just come once in a while and nobody really knows who I know, knows me at all. And they don't know how gifted and talented I am. And I just kind of feel like a nobody. Check this out. God knows who you are. And uh, God's going to use you just the way you are to do some magnif- magnificent things uh, for his glory. Can I get an amen? And I can I can't wait to, to preach this message. This is the fourth time today, but I'm more excited to preach right now than I was at the other three because this is the last one for me. <laughs> then I get to go eat some lunch in a little bit. And uh, so 1 Samuel chapter 16, if you have that, just give me a loud amen. amen. And uh, I, I just think this would be cool if I, re- if I prayed and then we read some verses. Does this sound good? Yes. Is it okay if I start out in prayer? Yes. And uh, I'm going to do it anyhow because this... Uh, I'm the senior pastor, so when you start your church, you can do whatever you want. So let's pray. Lord, bless your word. Amen. All right. That's it. That's it. Nothing in the Bible about long prayers, right? How many of you know that God hears that prayer right there? So nobody, nobody noticed. Uh, Point number one on your notes. I want you to write this down, and then uh, we're going to read verses one through three. I first want to talk about the mistake that God corrects, the mistake that God corrects. So your two fill-ins are mistake and Corrects. Let's all say it together now that you wrote it down at the count of three. One, two, three, go. The mistake that God corrects. Notice, notice I didn't say that God made a mistake. How many know God never makes mistakes? Uh, he, he never lies. He never makes mistakes. He doesn't put somebody in office. He's like, oh, what was I thinking? I blew it there. And uh, he didn't make the mistake. God's people made a mistake, and then he corrects the mistake. By the way, before I start reading the verses, how many are grateful that we serve a God that takes our mistakes and he corrects them, right? And anybody in the room at all ever got a second chance? How about a third chance, a fourth chance, a thousandth chance? And we make mistakes all the time, but the God that we serve takes our mistakes and he turns it around from good. I'm not even in the text. I'm already preaching right now. And he takes those mistakes and he corrects them. You're like, well, specific to the passage of scripture, what do you mean? Well, before we start reading, I got to get you up to speed, okay? So Israel was God's people, right? And uh, so he, he led God's people through a series of individuals. He started with Abraham. He was the father of many nations. And then God raised up Moses. And then Moses died. And God raised up uh, Joshua. And then after Joshua, there was a period, if you've ever read the Bible, there's a period uh, that was called the, the, the judges. And some of them, actually very few of them were actually good judges. But they would judge God's people. Most of them were horrible. They were bad and wicked. And they turned their back on God. So they had a series of judges. The last judge was a guy by the name of Samuel, okay? So he was the last judge, and he was a prophet in the Old Testament. So, you know know that when you read the Bible where God said, hey, go uh, into the Canaanite land and take out all the Canaanites. Somebody have ever read that? Or take out the Amalekites. He says, go in there, take out all these nations. And the Israelites didn't do that. And God said, I want you to do it, but they didn't do that. And they started having conversations with other pagan nations. And the pagan nations are like, hey, Israel, who's your king? And they're like, well, We have one, but he's not like here on earth. And they're like, you have one, but he's not here? What do you mean you have a king, but he's not here? Well, well, we have one, but he's in heaven. And they're like, dude, that is so lame. Like all all these, we all have kings and we can go to the king and we can get advice from the king. And that's cool that you have a king, but he's not on the earth. That is so lame. 
Yeah, our king's in heaven. So the Israelites started to complain against Samuel and they're like, hey, we, we need a king on the earth. And they started begging God and begging God and begging God. And then God gave them a king. His name was Saul. Hey, why don't you go ahead and vote? This is a good king. This is a bad king. Was a king, uh, Saul a good king? Bad king, right? Tall, dark, and handsome, but he was a bad king. He, was a, he started out okay, but he ended really, really badly. And uh, they're like, we want a king. We want a king. All the other nations have a king. We want a king. Begging, begging, begging. Be careful what you beg God for. Let me say it again. Be careful what you beg God for. It's amazing to me now, having been a pastor here at this church for 20 years and a youth pastor for eight years. Can I just say, can I use this word? I know it's probably not appropriate to use in church. The stupid things that people pray for. God, I want to show, what do you want? I want to get married so bad. You're 17 years old. You're not ready to get married. How about this? How about get a J-O-B first? Before you get married, stop begging God for a marriage party. You got to get a job. Well, I got a job. I know, but you're making slurpees at 7-Eleven, making minimum wage. You can't support, I want, right. And even 18-year-olds want a baby. I want a baby. I want a baby. You are a baby. <laughs> it's a dumb prayer to pray. Stop begging God for something that's going to devastate your life, all right? And there's people in our church, not this service, but the other services that come to our church and and like they buy a brand new car. You're like 19 years old. Brand new car. How much are the payments? Seven fifty a month. But I want it. I want a car. I want it. I know, but you're making eight hundred a month. You can't afford seven hundred and fifty dollar a month. So stop begging God for dumb things. So the Israelites are begging God for a king. He's like, you want a king? Here you go. You can have a king. And so they make a big mistake. But God corrects the bad mistakes that you and I make. So pick up. The text of 1 Samuel chapter 16, you ready to study? Yes. Verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil, because he's about to anoint the new king, and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of, of what? Every word is really important in the Bible. Bethlehem is not like New York City, it's not London, it's not Paris, it's not prestigious or popular. He says, go and you're going to find this guy in a really small town like... like Palmdale. He's not going to be in London. He's not, don't be offended, by the way, if you lived in Palmdale, you were born in Palmdale, or you're moving to Palmdale. I'm just saying, Palmdale is not New York City or LA or Chicago or London or Paris. So he says, go to Bethlehem. They're like, Palmdale? We're going to find a king in Palmdale? Yeah, go there. And verse 2, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul, the present king, hears it, he will what? So like, I'm scared to go there because if, if the King Saul hears that you're looking for another king, he's going to kill me. This is always really funny. So he's scared, and God says, hey, this is going to help. Take a young heifer with you. <laughs> what? It's a, it's, a, it's a female baby cow. <laughs> Hold it. He's going to kill me. I know. Take a young cow with you. That's going to help. Like, thank, thank you, God. And here's what you're going to say. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. Here's what you're going to do. You're to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Let me just stop there. Here's a couple beautiful things I love about God. The places that he chooses people from, Bethlehem, right? This isn't Jerusalem. Again, it's not New York City. It's not London. It's not prestigious at all. But check it out the kinds of people that God chooses. And we're going to find out the kind of people that God chose. But isn't it interesting the kinds of people that God uses in the Bible? Have you read your Bible recently? Like think about the, 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 the powerful leaders power that God chose. Let's start with Moses. Moses, God says, you got to deliver all of my people out of Egypt and, and you, got, you got to tell them. Here's what you're going to tell. And he's like, I'm a, I'm a stutter, stutter. I don't speak. Right? Why would, God, why would you choose somebody to go to Pharaoh that can't even speak eloquently? God chose a stutterer. God chose Noah. He got drunk in his tent, got naked. Right? God chose Jacob. The name Jacob means uh, swindler or cheater. Anybody know what Rahab did for a living? Prostitute. She was a prostitute and God used her. Matthew was a tax collector. He robbed people. Peter denied the Lord. Paul killed Christians. Aren't you grateful that God just uses people that are, like, I'm just, I just got I'm a misfit. I'm a misfit and I'm the king of misfits and don't look at me with that attitude. You are one too. But I love, God goes to these very obscure places and he picks out very obscure people. The word that I'm thinking of right now is ordinary. 
You are so stinking ordinary. In fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I've been dying to tell you this all service long, but you're ordinary. Turn to the person on the other side that's giving you an attitude right now. Tell them the same thing. Ordinary, ordinary. So he goes to Bethlehem, not to New York City, and he's gonna, we're going to find out he picks a 15-year-old kid. Let me say this. You know a little bit about my testimony. It's crazy that God chose me. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Don't you think when God chose somebody to pastor this church, he would have chose somebody that at least somebody in the family was a Christian on both sides of my family, as far as I know, parents, mother, uh, great grandmother, grandfather, all the way back, great, 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 no Christians. Father side, no Christians, no Christians, no Christians. No, not only no Christians, no pastors. Don't you think that like if God wanted to raise up a pastor and Oxnar to pastor this church, he would probably choose a pastor's kid that had some experience? No, he didn't do that. No Christians, no pastors on either side of me. And not eloquent, not smart at all. Don't give me an amen. I'm not very smart at all. I am here to tell you though, praise God, I was able to graduate the top 10%. Amen. Hold on, don't say amen yet. You haven't heard the rest. Top 10% of the bottom 2% of my high school class. Not smart. And, and I told you this, it, it, I was at Moore Park College and I took a speech class. I had to get up in front of people and, and speak. And that's scary for a guy like, I never wanted to do this. And, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this. It was before I was a Christian, so don't look at me like that. I went to the liquor store and I got like three or four beers and I drank the beers in the parking lot before I went into the speech just because I was so nervous to stand up in front of people. Young people, don't get any ideas. <laughs> Notice I said it was BC before I was a Christian. I'm the last, I'm the least likely person to stand up here and to do what I'm doing. It's a joke. It's a joke. And, and the person that God's going to choose in a second, you're going to sever. He's the, he should be the people's last choice. But they wanted a king so bad, God gave him uh, King Saul. He made a really bad decision, did some stupid things. And God said, hey, even though you made a mistake, I'm going to correct that mistake. Which brings me to number two. Here it is, the method. Let's talk about the method that God selects. How does God choose people is the question. Ready? 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 4 through 5. Are you still awake? Yes. All right. Verse 4. Samuel did what the Lord said when he arrived at Bethlehem. The elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. We're going to find out there were eight sons. Now, everybody look this way. I've preached on this passage before. I've read this passage a lot. I always thought that Samuel and Jesse go to Bethlehem. And here's the picture that I had in my mind, that it was out like at this little farm. And there was like 10 people there and they're going to choose the new king. Get the farm thing out of your brain right now. No farm. Everyone has to say no farm. Think of a fairgrounds, like the Ventura County Fairgrounds. And think about not like eight people or ten people. Think about hundreds. This is a big deal to choose the next king. So you got in your mind now pictures like a couple hundred thousand, maybe thousands of people. Because this is a big deal. Who's going to be the next king in Israel? And can you imagine Jesse, the father of eight, and probably Samuel. I just imagine in my eye, they're like in the, you know, the... The celebrity box, like at the Staples Center, they're up there. And uh, now God's going to have some sons walk in front of them. This is a big selection. It's a big choice. And uh, so farm out of your, your mind, fairgrounds with a lot of people. Here it is, verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, he's the first of eight sons, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Why? Why did the people think that this is the guy? Because if you know the Bible, you know that the first son was the heir to the throne. If you're son number two or number three, you didn't get as much. So the first guy came across, they're up in the box there, and they're like, first son, we definitely know it's going to be Eliab. And he's like, no, he's not the guy. Verse uh, seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. By the way, Verse 7 should be underlined in your Bible. This is like the top 10 verses in all the Bible. In fact, I want you to look at your neighbor's Bible, and if it's not underlined, I want you to go, what is your deal, man? you got to underline that. This is like one of the most popular verses in the Bible. So number one, son, he doesn't get selected. So here it is. Verse 7, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the... How many are grateful that God looks at the heart and not at the external things? Hey, check it out. God doesn't care what college you went to. 
God doesn't care how much money you make. God doesn't care about your power, your prestige, how successful, what neighborhood you live in, how much money you make, what kind of house you have, what kind of car you drive. That doesn't impress him. God looks at the heart. He doesn't care how many Instagram followers you have. He doesn't care how, about how suave and slick and, and awesome you are. He doesn't care about your BA, your MD. It doesn't matter to God. He doesn't look at what men look at. So the first guy gets rejected, verse 8. Then Jesse called son number 2. What's his name? Abinadab. He doesn't get chosen just because of his name is lame. He's like, no, next, next. And he had him pass in front of Samuel, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. The Jesse then said, number three, Shema. Sounds too much like Shamu. You're not in either. <laughs> Passed by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. The Lord has not chosen. You would have thought, man, if number one guy doesn't get at least number two or number three, he's like, do you have any other sons? And notice what he says. He says, yeah, I have another one. He's out tending sheep. Listen, he doesn't even mention him by name. Do you know people like that in your life? They identify you by what you do instead of who you are. And God's only concerned about who you are. Let me say that. I got to say this all the time in our church. Because we have people that come from broken homes and broken marriages and they're addicted to drugs and then God sets them free and they go to recovery and God sets them free. And, and you think because you've been taught at these different 12-step programs, you're always going to be an alcoholic. You're always going to be a con. You're always going to be whatever, fill in the blank. And I come to church to tell you today, you are not an ex-con. You're not an ex-addict. You're not an ex-anything. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. It doesn't matter, look at me, it doesn't matter what your parents say about you, it doesn't matter what teachers and coaches have spoken over your life, what an aunt or an uncle, it doesn't matter what anybody has said about you, it only matters what God says about you, and God thinks you're awesome, you're a son or a daughter of the Most High. So verse 11, still there's the youngest, Jesse answered, he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, end of verse 11, send for him, we will not sit down until he arrives. Okay, can you imagine hundreds of people like, number one, not him. Number two, not him. Number three is like, I, it's got to be me. It's got to be me. Nope, not you either. Four, five, six. You're just like, if you're one of the brothers, you're like, what is going on? How I many of you are thinking like, Samuel, you have drinking too many cappuccinos today. What's your deal? And he said, oh, I got one more son. So they send for him. You want to know how far they sent? Nine miles he had to walk to go get David. David's out on the field. Nine miles. They don't get to like get on their app and call Uber. <laughs> they walk nine miles and walk back. How long do you think that took? Probably a whole day. And you're, if you're at the fairgrounds, you're like, come on, we're hungry right now. We missed out on lunch. It's already past dinner. Would you hurry up and get David and bring him back here? Isn't that how it is? In my house, when I'm like, I'm done with dinner and I've I'm, I'm ready to eat now. Hey, where's Ryan? He's still upstairs. He's getting dressed or in the bathroom. I'm like, hurry up. Dinner's ready. So how many of the brothers are like ticked off? Like, would you hurry up and get back right now? Come on, I'm starving. And so he, they said, no, no, there's one other son out there, David. And Samuel anoints David. Here's the question on the table today, ready? What are the qualities that God looks for when he chooses leaders? What, what does God look for? Because he says in verse 7, he doesn't look at the same thing that man looks at. Man looks at the resume. By the way, how many know resumes lie? Resumes never tell you the truth. A resume is never going to say, hey, when I get hired at your company, I'm going to create a lot of conflict. <laughs> resumes never say, I, I come in late all the time and I stir up strife and division, okay? The, the world looks at resumes and they're impressed by resumes and first impressions. That doesn't impress God. The question is, what has impressed God? How, what does God look for when he's choosing a leader? Here we go, three things. Number one, number one is humility. Humility is the thing. Someone say humility. So in verse 12, he says, this is the one. They're like, David? Yeah, this is the one. By the way, how many of you in the room are the youngest in your family, youngest sibling? Raise your hand. These are all the bitter people. They're just like, <laughs> right? And you got left out of a lot, and you had to do all the grunt work, and you didn't, you get, you didn't get to sit, sit at the Thanksgiving table, right? You had a little cheesy table with all the young, right? All the other cousins, right? And so you were, and how many know, if you're the youngest of eight boys, there's no way you can be proud, because they're going to keep you humble. Check it out. 
So David was the man's last choice, but he was God's first choice. And again, the culture we live in is all about the external appearance. How many Instagram followers do you have? What kind of job? How much money do you make? Where do you work? What neighborhood do you live in? What kind of car do you drive? Social media, honestly, I mean, I, I, I kind of dumped Facebook a couple years ago because it's just grievous what people post in our church. Not this service, but the other services. <laughs> and I got Instagram and stuff. And it just, it cracks me up. Like people, like, how I many we only put our best side forward? Like, everybody's marriage is awesome. <laughs> Perfect all the time. Oh, honey, I love you so much. I love you as much today after seven and a half years that I did the first day we married. And every time I look at you, your eyes are like pools of sapphire in the moon. I'm just like, oh. oh so you, you guys never argue? When's like, let's just post like something real. Me and my wife got in a real bad argument today. She said this, I said this. She really ticked me off. And like, let's just be real, like, right? That's life, isn't it? Oh, your marriage is perfect, okay. And we did like, our kids are just unbelievable, perfect kids. Greatest athlete, greatest students. They never give you an attitude at all. Perfect is the word I'm thinking about. Lie. Vacation. Oh, we just had a perfect time. We went to Disneyland for three days. It was perfect. We took all five of our kids. It was awesome. Oh, really? The whole time it was awesome. Your kids never fought with one another. It, never, it was never a bummer standing in line for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, right? Or they just escort you to the front of the line because you're you. And, and, and it's not expensive there, and it wasn't hot that day. And, and I mean, oh, that's what happens at Disneyland. We never post that. It's just like, oh, we're so awesome at Disneyland, all of it. Yeah, lie, lie, lie. <laughs> and I mean, oh, social media presents this side of us where we have it all together. Again, the word I'm thinking about, you're so ordinary. I'm ordinary. That's refreshing. The greatest compliment you could give me is like, man, I just, the more I'm around Pastor Steve, he just seems so ordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago. Like, I know like some people in our church want to introduce whoever to their pastor. And I'm out in the line, hey, how you doing? And they're like, I've heard so much about you. And then I could just tell it's in their eyes. They're like, they're thinking like I'm going to be so much more impressive than I am. They don't say it, but they're probably thinking like, oh, this is the guy you're talking about? Like the word is ordinary. God doesn't care how gifted, how able, how prolific you are. He's looking for Humility. So I was reading a book this week. Here's the title of the book, American Girls, colon, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. Here's what a 13-year-old girl posted. We're on social media 24-7 and it's ruining our lives. We're hoping to hear back after we post something beautiful, hot, gorgeous, sexy. How you look is all anybody cares about anymore. If people aren't pretty nowadays, there's no purpose in living. This is what our teenagers are getting taught. How I look and how popular and what school I go to and how much money I make. Here it is, ordinary, ordinary. So God says, hey, I'm, I'm passing by son number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You got another one? Yeah, another one. He's out in the field. Check it out. Do you want to know, most theologians think he was about 15 years old. They're like, hey, Samuel, do you realize he's only 15? I know, that's the one that God wants. He's the last son of the eight. I know, that's the one that God wants. He's a shepherd. We need a king. I know, this is the one that God chooses. Why? Because you're going to discover David was a man of humility. Humility. Some of the people in our church think, like, I think Pastor Crystal needs to wake up. When is she going to discover that I have the most amazing voice? If I could just, if she would just go to YouTube and listen to how great my voice is, I, I guarantee probably next time I'm going to be leading worship. And Pastor Andrew, I mean, we have these New Life Institute classes and his wife, Chrissy, she's a good teacher and he's a pretty good teacher. But if they really understood how awesome I am and what a great teacher, I know the Greek and the Hebrew, they should be calling me tomorrow to teach a class. I can't wait for the next time Pastor Steve goes away because once he goes away, I need to be the guy up there speaking. It seems like every time he's gone, Pastor Andrew gets to speak. And if they knew how awesome of a communicator, I, no, 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 no. Do you know what? After God anointed David, David went back to the field, check this out, for seven years before he became the king. So before you get on the platform, how about this? Go to the children's ministry. 
Pick up a vacuum. Become an usher or a greeter. Hey, go to the convalescent home. Go to the old folk. Do, do, go to the hospital. Just visit patients that are dying with cancer. By the way, let me just remind you, you do not need a microphone to sing or to preach. Go into the streets with Pastor Ray. He'll take you there and start preaching there. Start a Bible club at your school or your office or work. And if that group goes from 5 to 10 to 50 to 100, then you can come talk to me about the fact that you want to plant a church. You don't need a microphone or a platform to do anything. God is looking for humble people. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I was at a conference a couple years ago, and me and another pastor were about to speak. I'm not going to mention his name. And before everybody came in to the conference, he was talking to me, and he goes, hey, can you believe that Another pastor in our denomination, it was the big, about a church of 10,000 people. Do you believe that Pastor So-and-so has asked me to take over the church? He goes, he obviously sees some incredible gifts in me. And there's no doubt why he, this pastor wouldn't have chosen me because of how gifted I am and how smart I am. And then he's just going like on and on and on. I was like, you kidding me? So after I heard him kind of talk about how awesome he was, I just basically said, hey, let me just remind you. You're ordinary. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 that all of us in the room are jars of clay so that the excellency will be of God and not of us. Amen. Okay? But he's just like, that was awesome. Can you believe it? And so he ended up taking the church. And when he got there, after about a week or two, they discovered back here in Ventura County, he was having an affair with somebody on his staff. Could it be connected to because he was just thought he was the most awesome, incredible leader? I'm telling you, pride comes before a fall. You want to be used powerfully by God? I'm not just talking about at church. Anywhere, you need to live a life of humility. So let's just say it out loud together. Ready? One, two, three. I am ordinary. One, two, three. One more time. I am ordinary. And that's refreshing. We're just ordinary. God's extraordinary. Number two, Integrity. Integrity. The second quality is integrity. Look at these verses coming on the screen. Psalm 78, verse 70 through 72. God chose David as servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. Here it is, ready? And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. God's like, I don't care about popularity. I don't care about public image. I don't care how slick your resume is. I don't care about charisma or persona or education or size or statue or influence. What I'm going after is integrity. The word integrity means complete, whole, innocent, or sound. God's looking for integrity. I was at the gym a couple months ago, and this guy comes up. We started talking a little bit, and he's just like, F-bomb, 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 blankety-blank, blankety-blank. After about four minutes, I'm like, dude, I'm tired of you cussing. So I, I, I left that conversation, and I walked out to about, I got to the parking lot, and he came running after me. He goes, hey, Pastor Steve, somebody, I was just talking. They said you're a pastor. I said, yeah. And he goes, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He goes, I, man, I was using all these profanities and stuff. And, and he goes, yeah, I go to another. He, he mentioned the church in Oxford, I won't name it. He goes, I, I go there. And he's like, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> so like, why would, why would I have to say, like, do I walk in? The, hey, just to let you know, before we have a conversation, I'm a pastor. <laughs> why wouldn't you talk to me? Like, if you thought I was a pagan, if you thought I was just anybody at the gym, why would you talk any different to me? Hey, whether you're talking to a pastor or a pagan, it should be the same. You should be the same person on Sunday morning as you are during the week. My, my kids have told me people in the church act different when you're around. Again, not this service. But sometimes because they're in the office, they'll call people in the church and like, hey, uh, Johnny, we saw that you signed up for the cleaning team. Well, I don't want to do it after. Like bad attitude. Okay, just let you know. Just let, who's this? Oh, it's Ryan. They're like, oh, Pastor Ryan. Ryan, you're Pastor Steve's son? Oh, God bless you. The Elsa Levitica. Like total change, total change. It shouldn't be that way. Integrity says this, I'm the same person on Sunday as I am any other time during the week. I love this illustration, true story. A police officer went, he just got off his shift. He was going, he wanted to get home to his wife and kids have uh, dinner and he had to stop at the supermarket to pick up a couple things and he got 
into the supermarket, came back, and he noticed that he parked in a no parking zone. This is so awesome. He pulls out his little thing, and he writes himself a ticket. <laughs> Illegal parking. I'm like, that is integrity. I would have wrote myself a warning. <laughs> warning, don't do it again. That's awesome, man. That's, that's integrity. I'm the same kind of person you see Sunday, Wednesday, Friday. It doesn't matter. I wrote this in my notes. It must be important. I bolded it, underlined it, and I put stars next to it. It's in the little things and the lonely places that we prove ourselves capable of bigger things. The Bible says that a person's steps are ordered of the Lord. A couple of years ago, I did a wedding at a, the Mandalay Bay. And it was actually out on the beach, but I had to walk through the lobby of the hotel. And I went out by the swimming pool and I was just kind of chilling there, suit tie. Everybody else was like in their bathing suit laying out and I looked weird. <laughs> I mean, no, I looked really weird out there, but they didn't understand where I was going. I was, I was not there to lay out and put on suntan lotion. I was there to go perform a wedding. Sometimes people go look at your life and they don't understand where God's taking you. A righteous man's steps are ordered of the Lord. And I'll tell you, before I ever got to get up here, I, right after I got saved, I started teaching a fourth and fifth grade Sunday school class. After that, I went to Bible college and I, every two, uh, Sunday at two o'clock in the afternoon, I'd go to an old folks home and preach. You're like, how was it? Not very good. <laughs> Not only was I bad, the crowd was worse. And I'd be like preaching my guts down. I was just like, and, and, not, and it just what, no feedback, no nothing. And one lady every Sunday, she'd be banging the table. Can you stop? We want to sing another hymn. I'm like, man, how do you navigate that? And, and, and I did that. I worked with junior hires for eight years. How many know I need some deliverance? Eight years of junior hires? Come on, man. And, and before you get up here, so let me just say this. Before... It, this, could be, this could be anything. This could be I want to one day be the president of the bank. This could be one day I want to be, I want to own in and out Burger. One day I want to be, you, you fill in the blank. You want to be the principal of the school. I'm telling you, you have to have integrity down here. You have to be humble down here. You have to treat people well down here before you get up here. So my, my friend Andy that just did the offering, he was a chief in the fire department. He was number two honcho in Ventura County. But before you got to be the chief, he'll tell you, he started on the hand crew at the age of 17. And if you're not faithful and you're not kind and you're not nice down here, you're never gonna be a chief or a senior pastor or a bank manager or a CEO. If you're not that way down here, what happens when you get up here? Your head's gonna get really, really big because pride puffs up. And if you don't learn to have the characteristics that God's looking for, humility, integrity down there, you're never gonna be successful up here. And I'm preaching right now. Yeah. Humility, number two, integrity. Here's the third thing, write this down. The third thing is competence. Competence, let's say that word together, ready? Compet or competency. Just means you're good at something. It means you're excellent. We, we try to do, we're not perfect, we try to do things around here with excellence. Why? Because, oh Lord, oh Lord, how excellent is your name. Yeah, but I got a, I got a kazoo and I rocked a kazoo. Can I get up on the stage? No, no. Um, and you have, to, you have to have a good voice to be on our worship team. I think everybody should, I don't, I don't think everybody should get up here. You have to be competent. How did Isaiah become a prophet to the king? Does anybody get to be a prophet to the king? No. He was excellent. He was wise. Excellence. Check it out. Excellence paves the way to influence. I told this story before, but a lady, I, I was really young and dumb. Our church was only a couple years old. She came to me. She said, hey, Pastor Steve, can I sing on Sunday morning? The Lord gave me this song. And I should have said no, because I should have. But she got up there and she says, oh, thank you. There's only maybe 100 people. She goes, I just want to thank the Lord. The Lord put this song on my heart. And she started singing. And I, I'm just, I'm not trying to be mean at all. It was really bad. Not everybody that thinks they can sing can sing. Come on, don't leave me up here. Let me say it again and give me an amen because I feel bad right now. Not everybody who thinks they can sing can sing. So she said, the Lord put this song on my heart. And she started singing. It was just like, like in three different keys. And honestly, I, I, I like looked up. I'm like, you gave her that song? Like, that was, it was bad, right? So you have to be excellent. Do you know, you have junior hires in high school, or maybe you have some teenagers in your house, and they are drawn to people, celebrities, athletes, entertainers, musicians that are excellent in their field. But 
Some of them are bad people and you wish that they weren't influencing your kids, but they follow them on social media. They watch their YouTube. Why? Because they're competent at what they do. They wear their jerseys, LeBron, Kobe, Bryce Harper, whatever, because they're competent. Even though that you don't like the fact that they're being influenced, hey, competence paves the way to influence people. So check out that verse that we showed earlier, Psalm 78. At the very end, it says, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. So he led them with a heart of integrity and he was good at something. So check this out. Imagine if when David was 14 or 15, he's out there on the field, right? What's he doing? He's a shepherd. So if you were to walk up to David and like, hey, man, how's it going out here? And he's like, it's going okay. What's today like? Well, kind of the same thing I did yesterday, just like watching over sheep. Do you ever have any free time? Yeah, I got I, free time once in a while. And like, what do you, what do, you do with your free time? I just, I, I made this little slingshot and stuff. I don't know if God would ever use it at all, but I just, I'll, I'll just pull out some stones and I'll start, start shooting a slingshot and stuff. And you'd be like, dude, that seems like a waste of time. That seems lame. Slingshot? How could God use a slingshot? But you know the Bible, know where that I'm going with this, right? So a chapter later, God's gonna use the slingshot to take down a giant. So that's cool, but don't you ever get bored of the slingshot? Yeah, and then once in a while, I'll bring my guitar out there and I'll just sit on a rock and I'll start singing some songs and stuff. And, well, that seems kind of boring. Not only do I sing songs, I like, to, I like to write some songs. I don't see how God can ever use you writing songs. Do you know there's 150 Psalms in the Bible? David wrote 73. So here's what I'm saying. When he was out in the field for those seven years, he was working on the gift. If you have a gift, you need to steward the gift. So you, you kind of want to play guitar, then you got, you got to practice, play scales, work on your voice, go to Bible college, take a class outside of the ministry arena. You want to be the CEO, you want to be the boss, hey, you want to be the best, you want to own In N Out Burger? Be the best French fry fryer on the planet. I'm telling you, be the best single mom. So other single moms can look at you and say, that's how they do it. Be the best stay at home mom because competence paves the way to influence. So God chose David because his heart was right. But listen, he also worked on his skill. And so God used the slingshot. God used the Psalms even to this day to minister to millions and millions and millions of people. Humility, integrity, the last word is compromise. Let me end with this. We're gonna sing a song and then we're gonna be dismissed because I'm hungry. My wife and I took over a youth group in 1990. It was probably a year after that, maybe two years. I went to a Promise Keepers event in San Diego. I was sitting way up high, like last row. How many have ever heard uh, Dr. Tony Evans? He's amazing. So I heard him preach, I was just like. So I called his church because they didn't have the internet back then and I just called his church and I said, hey, I." I just heard your pastor speak. Do you guys like sell like his, it was cassette tapes. <laughs> Young people don't know what cassette tapes are. <laughs> so they would put his sermons on cassette tape. And I said, Is there, do you, can you send those to me? And they said, well, it's just usually for those that attend the church. But if you'd like, you know, just send me a check or whatever. And we'll, so I started getting his tapes like 28, 29 years ago. He's an amazing communicator. So just kind of fast forward the tape now, maybe 20 years ago, my wife and I were at a conference in Dallas. We were with our friends. I'm like, I want to go check out his church. So we kind of sat again in the back and I listened to him preach again. I'm like, man, he's awesome. Maybe a year or two after that, I was finally the internet came out. I was watching one of his services online and his son came up to sing a song during the offering. He didn't have any music. He didn't write any music. He was a nobody. But I called the church and I said, hey, is there any way I can talk to Anthony Evans Jr.? So I got, I got in contact with Anthony. I said, hey, if you're ever in Southern California, we'd love to have you. So probably 14, 15 years ago, he came. Next year he came, he came, he came, he came. He's coming again next month. It's all the single ladies. <laughs> yeah, he's still single. Uh, you're excited. Uh, so he started coming a couple years ago, then his sister Priscilla came. She's amazing. Well, before that event, Anthony said, hey, is there any way, not only could my sister come, but my dad wants to come and do like a one day men's thing. So he came about three years ago and 
So I went into my office and somebody else had stepped out and I walked in, it was just the two of us. I've been following this guy from a distance. He's been a mentor of mine for many, many years. I'm in my office, just the two of us. Just making it to the show. Um, I got like every book, I've listened to every message he's ever preached. Out of that relationship, his other son, Jonathan, was here. Dr. Tony Evans used to be the chaplain for the Cowboys. Now Jonathan is the chaplain. So four years ago, Jonathan calls his brother Anthony that lives in the valley and says, hey, my wife's going to give birth this weekend. I'm not going to be able to come out to Oxnard to do the services, the chapel services for the Cowboys. Do you know of anybody in the area? So Anthony calls me and he's like, hey, I was just wondering if you would have some time. This, it was like three, to, like some time this weekend uh, to speak at the Cowboys chapel service. I'm like, well, let me pray about it. Now, wait, let, me, let me think about that for a second. Let me pray about it. And it was like, I, in fact, I told Andrew, I said, hey, by the way, you're going to be speaking here the first two services on Sunday. I'm going to do the Cowboys Chapel. So I went there like four years ago, and it was a Sunday morning. It wasn't mandatory. There was like 10 or 12 guys. I don't know. Next year, I did it again. And, and I did it again. And then last year, I went on a Friday night, and I took my kids with me. And there was like 40 or 50 people players and I'm a big Ohio State Buckeye fan and I'm preaching and like Ezekiel Elliott was like closer than Pastor Andrew I, I was just like Good. <laughs> and and I pre I'm just telling this is insane this is the guy that was flipping pizzas this is the guy that never wanted to do this this is the guy that's ordinary there's like 40 guys and then some of the people left and then Dak Prescott comes out. He's big, like 6'5". He's like, man, I was so blessed by your message. I was like, thank you, sir. <laughs> and then everybody left and then Jason Witten came up and he's like, I can't even tell you how impactful that was. Remember Jason came, then he came to all my kids and just said, hey, thank you so much for coming. He's an amazing person. Can't, you can't make this stuff, you, it's unbelievable. A little kid that never graduated, barely graduated, with no public speaking ability, who's not very smart, is not eloquent, speaking in front of the cowboys? Samuel Rodriguez was here a couple months ago. I'm like, dude, this guy's like, he oversees like a billion people on the planet. And he's just telling me in our office, man, that God's got his hand on your church and you guys are amazing leaders and man, God, you better build some buildings because what, what God wants to do in your church, it can't, I'm like, this is crazy. This is insane. I am, I'm telling you, I am so ordinary. And the more you hang out with me, you're gonna be like, dude, he's so unimpressive. Exactly, my point. Everybody in the room is a nobody. Everybody in the room, you're like, I'm so glad, Pastor Steve, you brought a message to the ordinary people. If you only knew, no, I know you. You're ordinary too. Now here's, the, here's the good news, ready? I'm ordinary, you're ordinary, ordinary. God is extraordinary. And here it is, true, true joy, true happiness, true peace, True purpose from come, uh, comes from understanding those two things. I'm ordinary, he's extraordinary. When I put those two together, I understand. Hey, that's real joy, that's real peace. This is not about me and my wife. It's not about our pastors. I say it all the time. If we got hit by a truck today, God would raise somebody up. The church would go on fine. Every time in the life of our church, a quality couple or leader has stepped out, God just raises up the next person. Do you think he's like, what are we gonna do? Moses is gone. No, Joshua's right there. God's got people in place. We're ordinary, but God says, hey, you stay humble. You live a life of integrity. You work on your skill behind the scenes and I'm gonna open up doors that no man can shut. And I'll shut doors that no man can open. Amen. I'm in control, I'm sovereign. Would you stand to your feet? How many are grateful that he is an extraordinary God? Come on, put your hands together. Would you allow me to pray an ordinary prayer to a bunch of ordinary people? Yes. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. And God, thank you that thousands of years ago, David was a nobody, nobody noticed, but you noticed him. 
And God, he had to wait, but his steps were ordered by you. God, I thank you that our steps are being ordered by you. And I thank you, Lord God, even as I'm thinking about those that have been waiting for a dream, waiting for an opportunity, waiting for a ministry, waiting for an idea, waiting for a promotion, waiting for a new job, waiting to get married, waiting to have kids. Thank you, God, that you are found in the waiting. And God, help us like David to not wait with an attitude. Help us to wait in humility because you're in control. Thank you that you're ordering our steps. God, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank, I thank you for the people of God. And God, as we go out singing this one last song, we thank you that the love of God is a real thing. We love you. We bless you. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And all the God's people said.